Yeah, there we go. Okay, so today's speaker is Indrino, one of our first year PhD students, and he's going to talk about a tale of two galaxies. Indrino. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking mostly about the local group of galaxies, uh, the Milky Way and Andromeda, um, with a view to understanding more about the current standard model of cosmology. So, first of all, um, when we look at galaxies, you can use Newtonian gravity and an estimate of where the visible mass is to try and predict how quickly it should rotate. Um, and you get like something looking like that. It should fall off, just like in the solar system. But the observed um, rotation speeds like actually stay flat, so there's a big discrepancy. Uh, and that might be due to dark matter, which can raise the force, basically. Now, um, the, so the picture I want you to have in mind is uh, of a disk galaxy with this um, halo of dark matter around it. Um, but this is only an artist's impression. A galaxy actually it looks like this. Um, so there isn't any like dark matter that you can see directly. So the, if there is dark matter here, it's hypothetical, right? It's not been confirmed. So uh, yeah, uh, what I wanted to say was um, if you can't predict the motions from the visible mass, then dark matter has to exist, because there has to be some extra degree of freedom. Um, but if you can predict uh, motions from the visible mass, then you don't actually need dark matter. In fact, like the data would disfavor it in that case, because you don't need the extra freedom. Um, but of course, if the rule for, for going from the visible mass to the motions was not Newtonian gravity, then you might need a different theory of gravity. Um, so I'll just show you like data from about like 100 rotating disk galaxies. What we plotted is the force divided by the force you expect from Newtonian gravity. Uh, and on this axis will be the gravitational acceleration, basically. Um, so it, it looks like this. <coughs> which is to say, um, if you knew the distribution of visible mass, and thus um, Pn, Newtonian gravity, you would actually know like how much to boost gravity by and therefore get the actual forces. So that's interesting. Um, now, let's have a look at how Newtonian gravity works. So this is the basic equation uh, behind it. Uh, and if you have a rotating disk, then you can work out V. So that's what I was doing, basically. Now. We know that this doesn't always work. So if you have, uh, if you try and apply this equation with v, like, and you get an answer that v is close to c, then that doesn't um, work very well anymore. You can start to get deviations from this. Um, so that might happen near a black hole. Now, do we get deviations from Newtonian gravity because of quantum effects? Um, that's what I'm going to talk about. So basically. Classical theories assume you can get positions and velocities arbitrarily accurately. But we can't actually do that, of course. Um, so this basically is just a schematic description of how space-time might look like if there was a mass there. Um, so classically, it looks perfectly smooth. But in reality, it must look something like that. Um, now, you, this might look like, um, well, similar to that. That's reasonable. But supposing the mass was like very small, so there's very little acceleration. Um, so you'd get something classically which is like very little curved. And quantum mechanically, you get it looking like that. So basically, the idea is that um, the quantum fluctuations um, as a fraction of like how much gravity there is become more important if you have less gravity. So when you have very little gravity, quantum effects might become important, essentially. Um, so it's. Sure. I have a question. I don't, I don't want some quantum fluctuation of what? Um, uh, the degrees of freedom in the space time. We don't exactly know what they are. But there must be something causing the gravitational field, and it can't be sort of have a particular value. It must be uncertain, right? Um, so it's, it, this is just a schematic description of what I was saying. Um, yeah, and also the important thing to realize is that the vacuum fluctuations of this sort do actually, we think it carries a small amount of energy as well. I'll come to why that is. Um, the main reason for that is because we can see the universe accelerating apart. Uh, and it, well, if you had like a quantum harmonic oscillator, there would be a minimum like, zero point energy. 
So you think it's similar for space-time, that it has a very small amount of zero-point energy, which you can call dark energy, and you can measure how much that is. So you don't need to understand quantum gravity to do that, of course. You can just measure that. Um, and um, the important thing is you can then say that we can find out when quantum gravity effects should actually become important. Uh, basically, uh, the, this is the classical result for the energy density in a gravitational field. So that's been known about for centuries now. Um, it works in linear general relativity. Uh, this is some kind of quantum effect, which we don't know where that comes from. But still, you, can, you know how much that is. So what you can do is you can set the two equal, uh, which m makes g equal this much. So it's a very small number. Uh, and um, Right, so basically, the picture you should have in mind is that if you change the strength of the gravitational field, and classically, the energy density in the space-time is just minus like g squared, is a constant, so it should just go like that. But you've added this quantum effect, because somehow it has to be there. Uh, so what actually happens to the total energy density? Like, do, do we just add them in a simple way, or is there some kind of smooth interpolation between constant there and... I mean, no one really knows what happens. So th that's the basic idea. to keep in mind is that we don't actually know what should happen. Um, so, so what happens if gravity is that weak? As I said, we don't know. Um, but um, just trusting classical gravity theories blindly is probably not such a great idea. Um, I mean, you, you wouldn't really be able to explain why they should necessarily work. There's a good chance they won't. Um, now, that means, of course, that if you had like smaller smaller accelerations, like much below this threshold, then the discrepancy might be quite large. Um, but much above the threshold, then there might be no discrepancy. So if you actually see in the data a uh, di discrepancy with the classical gravity theory, that is sort of larger at lower accelerations, and smaller above this acceleration, then that might be a signature of quantum gravity effects, essentially. Um, now, uh, Sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I showed you that the, that is indeed what happens. That classical gravity appears to break down below a certain acceleration scale. Uh, so if you have a plot where you sh it should break down because of quantum gravity effects, and you get like the correct sort of order of magnitude. Just to give you an idea, so this is obviously one order of magnitude. The solar system would be like way over there somewhere at about one meter per second squared, right? So we don't know. There's no laboratory experience showing you how gravity does actually work here. This is just data from galaxies. Um, but um, anyway, this is interesting because it shows you that this might be a signature of quantum gravity. Um, right, now, if you try and um, do the same trick, where you plot for each of these data points, not the acceleration or the energy density in the gravity, but you plot some other variable, like how far away that particular point is from the center of the galaxy where you're measuring it, then there's no correlation whatsoever. That's because presumably distance from a particular point isn't a physically important thing, whereas um, acceleration is, because if you're sitting in like a spacecraft, I guess you could find out how much you're accelerating, whereas you couldn't necessarily find out how far you are from the galactic center. Um, so, so the, uh, yeah, you can't just get this correlation like any other way. Um, so this brings me on to the idea of modifying Newtonian dynamics, uh, which uh, is going to be done in an empirical way. Um, so this is, uh, was developed by Mordechai Milgram about uh, 30 years back, and uh, what it does is it simply multiplies Newtonian gravity by some factor, essentially. Um, the reason why um, we, it doesn't have exact predictions for how much you would need to mod modify gravity by has to be done empirically is because you can't um, work out quantum gravity from first principles. So there has to be some flexibility. Um, now, basically what it does, of course, is just draw a line through like all the data, right? Um, so this is how it would work, essentially, is that you would set the actual gravitational field uh, times some constant to equal the Newtonian gravitational field. And this new function is one for um, essentially for very strong gravity, um, which would make G and G unequal. But the uh, trick comes when 
uh, x is much less than 1, so you have very weak gravity, and then g becomes like square root of g and a naught because the function becomes equal to the argument. Um, now, if you then say, uh, say that you had a point mass, which becomes reasonable when you're in far out in a galaxy, um, then you get like this, of course, by square rooting g n. Um, so, like, how would that equation actually like work with real data, though? So, essentially, what would happen is you'd equate it with a centripetal acceleration, and you'd get this result, right? Um, so that is um, a link between the level at which the rotation curve flatlines and the mass. Now, if you actually look at real data, what you'll find is that it's worked quite well. Um, so on the x-axis is the um, flatline level of the rotation curve, the flat level, uh, and this is the baryonic mass. Now, you can see that it's worked in both star and gas dominated galaxies because um, Star dominated ones are dark blue and gas are light blue. So it, it's actually like worked across like all types of galaxies. Um, now I'll just try and explain like, so obviously I've given you an explanation with modified gravity. I'll try and give you an explanation with like the standard model of how this kind of correlation might come about. So um, in classical gravity, if you had like a certain ratio between dark matter and baryons, uh, galaxies would follow the dashed line. So that's obviously not right. But um, then the galaxies might not all have the same ratio of variance to dark matter. So um, what actually has caused the drop here? So remember, galaxies are do dominated by uh, dark matter. So you're allowed to lose a lot of baryons and still have the same like dynamics, essentially. Um, so uh, the loss can be explained by a number of mechanisms. You could have things like supernovae going off, blowing out gas. Um, the thing is that in small galaxies, you might only have a few um, of these supernovae. Uh, and uh, the, there should be some like stochasticity to the process. It should be random a little bit. Uh, it should also depend on the environment of the galaxy, like how much gas can it accrete. Because galaxies can also go up in principle, right? Um, and like how much stars it's formed. Obviously, if it's formed less stars, it'll probably have had less supernovae. Um, now, that, for that reason, I think that uh, having a tight correlation of how much fraction of baryons you've lost uh, with the mass is unusual because there should be uh, some scatter. Like this is essentially just observational scatter, but there should be like actual astrophysical scatter. Um, now, just to give you an idea, um, if a galaxy is the same mass but is much bigger, it should be much easier to blow gas out of it. Uh, because the potential is much shallower in the outer parts. So uh, galaxies obviously don't all have the same size. If you have the same mass, essentially, then there could be a huge range of sizes. Um, but you must have lost the same fraction of your baryons anyway. So the, it's a little bit weird how that happened. Um, now, uh, yeah, so far I've only talked about the flat line level of the rotation curve. Um, so if you look at the rest of it, so this is a low surface brightness galaxy, uh, then the Newtonian curve does that. Uh, the Mond curve is the Newtonian curve multiplied by some factor, basically. So obviously it does some, something similar, but like higher up. Um, the, with dark matter, you have to add like a smooth halo of dark matter around the galaxy. Um, it can't like clump and form you know, objects in the same way as baryonic matter, because it can't cool. So it ends up leading to a smooth curve, which is sort of like that. Um, so that, um, I think, is an indication that the dark matter can't actually be the correct explanation, because it doesn't get this feature in the data. Um, but um, there's a lot more rotation curves uh, which look um, similar. This is called Renzo's rule. Uh, so this is one galaxy. I'll just show you another one. A much heavier one. This is like the Milky Way with a relatively small discrepancy um, because the accelerations are higher. Uh, but this time, uh, modified gravity has also worked pretty well at explaining, in this case, a much smaller discrepancy. Um, so there's also the data on uh, about 90 other galaxies which I had in the graph where I showed the acceleration discrepancy as a, against acceleration. Um, so. Um, I had to vary the mass to light ratios in these models essentially to make it work, right? Because we don't know exactly how much mass to light ratio the stars have. 
So we um, fit the curves so we bring the galaxy mass and you actually don't measure the mass, you directly measure the brightness. Um, but if you knew the color of the stars, you could know roughly what sort of stars the galaxy has. Um, and then you could predict the mass to light ratio based on how we understand stars, roughly speaking. Um, now, of course, if you did that, then the resulting estimate of mass um, combined with the gravity theory that we're using, it has to explain galactic dynamics, if it's correct, right? Um, so what actually happens is that if you look at the mass to light ratio in the blue band uh, against like a measure of color, then theoretically it should follow this like black line with like some amount of uncertainty, because star formation is random to some extent. Um, and um, the points are where um, the mass to light ratio that is required in order to make one fit that galaxy's rotation curve. So you can see what's actually happened is it's matched like the slope and the normalization and also it, the amount of scatter as well is more or less matched. Um, now that's in the blue band, in the infrared band um, it actually is similar. The observations often work a bit better in the infrared because there's much shallower gradient. But uh, leaving that aside, like, it's a, the main thing to realize is that the mass red light ratios that I was using to, the people were using to actually fit the rotation curves are actually reasonable. Um, they're not just pulled out of the air. Um, so now I'll focus on like um, formation of structures. So that's really what I wanted to talk about. Um, so if this is like a simulation of uh, something like the local group. You have like large amounts of dark matter, like lots of substructure. Um, you get like close to spherical symmetry there. Um, and the satellites, there aren't that many satellites actually in the sky, so I'm, there must be some way to keep a lot of these dark. But um, leaving that aside, um, we're just going to look at the actual satellites. Um, so our satellite galaxies actually mostly lie in a thin plane. Um, and which is also co-rotating with the proportion of the largest objects. And um, you might think, well, it's perfectly possible to get like a disk-like structure because the Milky Way is a disk. Um, but this is like actually at right angles to the Milky Way disk, which is like there. Um, and also it's on a really large scale. So it's very weird how this came about. Um, now, uh, yeah, uh, you can see this, like there's, um, in this image there's a galaxy here, and there's a really faint like amount of material around there, like uh, that's a tidal feature. Um, so um, that, just uh, keep that in mind because it's a real image after all. Um, now what I think happened um, is that um, the structure of satellites around the Milky Way formed in an interaction. Uh, so another galaxy flew past and pulled material out. So in this image, you could, which is a real one, you can see that that actually does work in other systems. Um, so, um, but I'm going to try other explanations first because that explanation is highly controversial. So if you'd, uh, just to keep in mind, that does also work in the simulations, um, of course. Um, so we'll try some other explanations. Uh, as, right. So what's shown here on the x-axis is the like angular spread of the galaxies in the model, and this is like how spread they are actually. So for a model to sort of explain an anisotropic structure, it needs to have a reasonable amount of probability in the gray region. Um, so the, the, these um, eight models are actually like standard model simulations. Nothing particularly unusual. No interactions, just like primordial objects. And none of them actually really got like a good explanation of the data. So none of these really work. Um, so can, can, can you explain how you do those simulations? Uh, I'm not entirely sure how these were done, but these are the Aquarius simulations, uh, if you want to look them up, and these are the Via Lactea ones. Um, mm -hmm. So if you uh, try and look at um, uh, look at uh, scenarios involving an interaction, then uh, the, uh, these four worked. I'll explain these three first. They're not actually very good because they involve a merger of a heavy object with the Milky Way, which would probably have disrupted its disk a lot. 
Um, so that's not ideal. Um, this one in, would not have done that because that involves a flyby of a galaxy with the same mass as our own one. So that actually wouldn't have destroyed our disk. So that might work. Um, well, it, in theory it works. Um, the issue is like, what on earth actually flew past? Because it can't subsequently have merged, otherwise it will be like, disrupted to the disk. So I guessed, um, a lot of people have guessed that it must have been Andromeda that actually flew past because there aren't really any other heavy objects with the same mass as the Milky Way nearby. Um, so, if you then try and look at Andromeda... Uh, would you, the 4 to 1 merger, would that also destroy the disk? Uh, so this might possibly... I don't know, like, mm. it might be able to maintain it. You'd have to look at the thick disk. To, right. There's, I'll argue, I'll like, give an explanation as to why any kind of merger scenario won't actually work at the end. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, so if you look at Andromeda's, uh, like, satellite galaxies, they end up in a, well, mostly they end up in a thin plane as well, which is a bit odd. Um, now, they're actually co-rotating, and uh, we view it edge-on somehow, so um, that, that is also a bit weird. Uh, so this is actually quite a highly anisotropic structure. Um, now, uh, yeah, just to give you an idea, so the things below Andromeda essentially are going away from Earth, and things above are coming towards Earth. Uh, with that, and because the velocities are, well, I've just shown the radial velocities. Um, we don't really have proper notions on these. Um, but you can still see that it is likely to be a co-rotating orbital structure. Now, so it might be reasonable for Andromeda to have flown past, but that can't actually work with Newtonian gravity. So I. Uh, integrated like the um, positions and velocities of the Milky Way and Andromeda back in time uh, from like here. And the, you can't actually get them to fly by each other at close range like that. In fact, it's a struggle even to get them to sort of like satisfy the timing argument, as it's called. So um, you can't really have had a flyby like that. You might have had a merge with some smallish object, um, as you're suggesting. Um, but without an interaction, the satellites end up essentially isotropic. Um, so without an interaction, you're back to all of these eight models, none of which really work. So, um, so what, what is this curve in the red? Can, can you explain how you compute this? Oh, this is like the why you integrate the Milky Way and Andromeda like position of the velocities back in time. So we're only showing the separation because they're on a radial orbit, essentially. Um, it's, it's just um, so this is a Newtonian so gravity thing. Takes, take the uh, what, take the center of mass for each of the galaxies. Then you integrate like good in direction? Uh, you integrate you know, back in time. And, and you have the tides, so how? Well, what's, what are the equations you are? Well, it's just inverse square law of gravity between the galaxies. I'll actually ex give the equations for the timing argument at the, towards the end. Um, so you have two point masses? Yes. Two point mass, and then you integrate this back in time? Yeah. Um, well, I'll show the equation for this kind of situation in the end in case you wanted to try it. Um, it's not actually that tr tricky to try out. Um, so, um, just to give you an idea of how likely it is to get 15 galaxies, which are, and, uh, and 13 of them to be co-rotating, so, um, that's actually quite unlikely. So, basically, if you um, call a galaxy like A or C, depending on whether it's going around clockwise or anti-clockwise, um, you'll get like 15 A's and C's. So, there'll be 2 to the 15 possible sequences, obviously. Um, now, you need to actually get more than or equal to 13 A's in order to get that much, well, in order to explain the observations. But, of course, it could be, it could have been going the other way, so you could also have more than or equal to 13 C's. So basically, the, the, if you look at how many A's do we need, you need, well, either that, 13, 14, 15, or 0, 1, 2, right? Um, now, if you just work out how many sequences um, actually are like that. So if, if you want zero A's, there's only one sequence like that because they all have to be C. Uh, and if you want 15 A's, again, it's the same. If you want one or 14, then there's 15 possibilities in each case um, because you choose one object, which is odd one out. And if you wanted like two or 13, then you get 105 in each case because um, you have to pick one object and then you pick another from the remaining 14. So what ends up happening is that you get 242 possible sequences um, out of the 32,768. So this is actually quite unlikely to get, even if assuming, even assuming you had 15 galaxies in a plane somehow, 
it's still quite unlikely that they'd be co-rotated. Um, so, um, yeah, now I'll show like more details, like um, comparison with simulations. So if you, what you want is a co-rotating system of satellites, uh, which is thinner and wider than the observed system. You can define it with the aspect ratio instead, but um, what's shown here is the um, thickness of the system of satellites in a simulation, where you had lots of galaxies and lots of satellites. Uh, this is the extent, so it's like the same orientation as that. Um, and um, there was like 8,000 nearly objects, and three of them sort of worked in some sense, right? So you, um, but we'll look at this one, like what actually, is that a reasonable match to the actual satellites? Um, so it looks like it, right? I mean, this is a simulation. So it, it, from the side it looks like this. So now you can start to see it's not actually like the real thing because it's only one object here and the, all the rest are there, which is a bit odd. That's not like the real thing. Um, there's also a really heavy object there, which I'm going to explain why that is important. Essentially what happened is that you had a galaxy with its own system of satellites um, approach like a heavier galaxy and uh, get disrupted. Well, the satellite system got disrupted. Um, so that leads to an isotropic structure. So that actually is like a good idea if you ask me, uh, because um, it will lead to results looking like that, and uh, it might explain you know, the actual system. Um, the thing is that uh, none of the um, satellite galaxies of Andromeda are really heavy enough to have like, hosted all of them like that. Um, you could like argue about M33. That could actually just about. And um, well, if you ignore the fact that it's a little bit off the plane, maybe. Um, so the issue with this, um, comes about when you realize that M33 is going like the wrong way. So that actually can't be the right explanation. Um, now, um, so let's try like without these often satellites as they're called. You disrupt a satellite system. Um, so you exclude that because that's not really going to work with the real system. Um, in that case, you can't actually get anything thinner and wider than the real system. So because there were 5,000 galaxies, uh, the rate of occurrence would be less than one in 5,000. Um, so these are standard model simulations, just dark matter though. So what happens if we try and um, include like baryons? Could that actually help with explaining the observations? Um, so you, um, first of all, the dark matter can't like cool and form thin disks. So naturally planes of satellites are going to be hard to explain. That's fundamentally what's going on. Now, but you obviously do have baryons which can form thin disks. Um, so that much is obvious, right? So Andromeda is like a disk. So maybe if you just pull material out of the baryonic disk, you could somehow form a thin plane of satellites. Um, so basically, you have to have another galaxy to do that, obviously. Material like in ordered circumference in order to get out of the plane, no reason. But interactions between galaxies do happen, right? Um, so what happens is the baryons end up mostly in the common orbital plane of the interacting galaxies. So it ends up being an anisotropic structure. Um, so this is all good, right? Now you get like a thin, dense tidal tail from the baryons because they're on like ordered circle motion that you could get pulled out. But it still stays close to the original density. Um, and therefore you could form galaxies, you know, from the tidal tail where gravitational collapse the same way as you form galaxies anyway. Um, the thing is, the dark matter is dynamically hot for a galaxy, it's in a spherical halo, which is pressure supported. So if you pull that out of a galaxy, it just go in like everywhere. It won't form a dense like cloud easily. So you, you can't get the dark matter to sort of collapse into galaxies in this kind of scenario. You might get baryons to collapse. Um, so yeah, so basically you pull baryons out of a disk and you get like a dense tidal tail, which is baryon. There's, this is not dark matter dominated at all, right? Um, the same way as you wouldn't think the disk was dark matter dominated. It might have dark matter around it. Um, so, so this is all fine in theory, right? You get a baryonic tidal tail um, and baryonic galaxies, which will distribute anisotropically. The good thing with this scenario is the galaxies do actually form like that. Um, 
but um, the satellites won't be able to accrete dark matter in the halo of the main galaxy because um, that dark matter is only at half the escape speed of the parent galaxy, which is much more than the escape speed from the satellites. Um, so, like, apart from the fact that the satellites don't have any dark matter, there's nothing inherently wrong with this uh, scenario. Um, so, is everything going to work now? Well, I guess all you have to do is look at the satellites and see if they have any dark matter. Um, so, now you try and explain the internal dynamics of the satellite galaxies using Newtonian gravity without adding dark matter. What will happen is the mass to light ratio against like, the brightness of these objects. Um, so immediately you can see that it actually doesn't work, but um, because like, the mass to light ratio should be around 5, basically, but not like 1,000. Um, but you could argue that maybe they're being disrupted by tides from the Milky Way because they're quite nearby. Um, so maybe we would try that out um, to reconcile the theory. So what's shown here is a fraction of the force that could be attributed to the baryons uh, using a like, dynamical equilibrium analysis. Um, and on the x-axis is the relevance of tides to the system. So it's the actual size divided by the tidal radius. So the tide's not relevant on this side. Um, now, the, you can see that none of these objects should really be much affected by tides. More importantly, there isn't a correlation between how much an object is affected by tides and how much the discrepancy is. So basically, tides are not actually causing the discrepancies. Um, something else is causing the discrepancies. Now, what, logically, you would think that it was caused by dark matter, if you're thinking the standard paradigm. Um, now, the satellites can't really have dark matter because they're in thin plane, so they need to have had a violent origin, an inter in interaction of some sort. Now, um, because they also have strong internal gravity, uh, you can't actually explain the satellite's internal dynamics using neutron gravity, unless you add dark matter, which I've just said you can't do. So what that means is that neutron gravity actually does not work in these objects. So we need to try alternative modeling. Now, um, you try out modify neutron dynamics, and that explains like a lot more of the data, but not all of it. Um, so you have like still these objects which are discrepant. Um, so again, you'd have to redo the analysis of like the tidal radii, though, if you change the gravity theory. So what happens now if you try and explain this with tides? What will happen is that um, actually the objects here, which are not much affected by tides are in, agree in agreement with the theory. Um, but the objects which are here, well, they're very close to the tidal radius, so they actually, it's legitimate for the theory to fail in these objects, basically, because they're not in equilibrium. Um, so you can see that with MON, things essentially work out for the sample of galaxies that's not much affected by tides. Um, now, the other thing to realize is that um, a flyby of the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies actually is um, inevitable with the theory because gravity is much stronger with it. So they end up like falling in like that. Um, so in this theory, a flyby is also an inevitable outcome. Um, now, one thing that I haven't yet shown is um, the alignments of everything. So basically, this is a sp um, spherical polar coordinate system. And it, it, to define like a plane, we're going to like use the normal to the plane. Um, so the Milky Way um, angular momentum vector is like that, and that's the Andromeda disk spin vector. Um, now this is where Andromeda's um, disk of satellites is, and that's for the Milky Way's like, disk of satellites. Um, now you might be thinking, well, why are they not in the same plane? Uh, because they should actually end up in the common orbital plane. Um, the reason is that what actually is going on is that the angular momentum is the sum of what met angular momentum the material initially had with coming from a rotating disk, which is like not zero, right? And any angular momentum gained from the other galaxy by tidal interactions. So um, the material must in the satellites must have started with angular momentum there for Andromeda and here for the Milky Way. Now if you postulate that the angular momentum of the galaxies that orbit each other is up here, then for the Milky Way, you expect to get a result for its satellite somewhere along that line, like in between, right? So it could be there, right, where it actually is. For Andromeda, the argument would be that it has to end up along this line, so it's reasonable to end up there. Now, the key thing to realize, of course, is that the 
or which an angle of momentum must be there, which um, is consistent with the observed direction, like which is here, right? Because of the error bar, which is reasonably large. Um, so this is, um, I think it's a reasonable sort of model uh, to have formed satellite planes um, in a tidal interaction. Um, now, uh, just to show you, there are other galaxies which are interacting as well um, right now. Uh, so it, this is the NGC 5291 system. It's like a ring of material, like another galaxy is like full material out. So you, in a simulation, you can reproduce most of the features. Uh, it's just an interacting galaxy thing. Um, but you form like dense like clumps of gas in there. So that, that's why the tidal tail has gravitationally collapsed into galaxies. So these are tidal dwarf galaxies, as we call them. Now, um, obviously, because the tidal dwarf galaxy, you can see it, right? Um, the dark matter and the baryons should have been separated by the interaction. Um, so if you look at the data, maybe it'll all work with Newtonian gravity. Um, but actually, what will happen is that the data like fall up there, and the Newtonian gravity model falls like much lower. So these are actually gas dominated, so it becomes easy to actually compute the model. Um, so what this shows, uh, I think, is that the um, discrepancies, the acceleration discrepancies that people see are not actually due to dark matter, because in these systems, the violet nature of their origin should have gotten separated the barriers in the dark matter. So acceleration discrepancy is due to something else. Um, so just to recap the logic quickly, you observe galaxies within tidal tails, and nearby satellite galaxies are within thin planes. So this much is certain, right? Now, we've tried alternative explanations. None of them really work. So you conclude that the local group satellites were formed from tidal difference, which, is, uh, which does work. Um, now, therefore, they should only have baryons in the standard model, because the dark matter can't cool and form dense. Well, it can't really form dense anything, right? Like, it can't dissipate and clump. Um, the problem with this scenario of having no dark matter in the satellites, the satellites have a high velocity dispersion, so they have quite strong self-gravity. And I was showing that that's not due to tides. So um, the consequence is that you can't explain internal dynamics using neutral gravity like that. Um, so you must have a modified gravity theory. Now, um, yeah, so you, are, so you were asking about like, the timing argument. So the timing argument, um, as far as it's, as it's called, comes down to this. So you imagine you have a center of your coordinate system there. You look at another object like somewhere. Um, it, in a homogeneous universe, the vector like just grows with a right the scale factor. So therefore, r double dot will equal that, right? So that what happens if you add like inhomogeneities, like point masses into this? So what will happen is that you simply add like the gravity from the masses, basically. So this is essentially the equation that you solve for like doing timing argument calculations. Um, now, um, well, I did that for the local group, and uh, what you do, what I did is you assume all the masses in the Milky Way and Andromeda, and they're on a radial orbit, which is reasonably good. So you end up with an axisymmetric model, you evolve lots of test particles forwards, and these are the locations, the black dots locations of actual galaxies. I haven't indicated what their velocities are, but you can see that this galaxy should be approaching the Milky Way, and this one should be receding, right? So if I show this on a Hubble diagram, it'll look like this. So the radial velocity is plotted against distance in megaparsec. Um, these are just to indicate distances only. Don't worry about the velocities. So in the model, what happens is that um, this is the blue line is what would happen in the absence of any inhomogeneity. Uh, but gravity has moved like the velocities below that. Now, very near the Milky Way and Andromeda, um, the velocity field is disturbed because things are completed in multiple orbits around the galaxies. But further away, the velocity field is quite smooth. So what should happen is that um, it, you, know, you can explain the observed velocities fairly well within like, uncertainties. Otherwise, a neutral gravity isn't right, and uh, the flyby of Andromeda caused like a huge amount of dynamical heating to the local group. So the velocities are no longer going to work with Newtonian gravity. So that might happen. Now we have to see what actually does. Um, now they, these authors uh, in Edinburgh, they did a basic 1D model for the local group. Uh, and uh, they got like data points from that. Um, the important thing to realize is this fair bit of scatter, um, which they couldn't easily understand. In the context of their model, uh, 
galaxies would have to follow the pink line, um, which they don't really. But if you change the mass, then it just shifts the line. It doesn't explain the scatter. Um, so um, it, if you do a detailed 2D model like I was doing, then you require an extra like dispersion beyond measurement uncertainties of about another 50 kilometers per second. In fact, that's much more than measurement uncertainty, so it's just astrophysical. Um, but the thing is, where did they, all this extra dispersion come from? Because local group galaxies only rotate about 15 kilometers per second. They can't deflect other objects by much more than that. Um, so that's a bit of odd. Um, Can you know? Yeah. Um, so if you just uh, look at the um, model uh, radial velocities in the observation, you do see there's a large amount of scatter. Uh, so that was actually there, but um, where did it come from? Um, as I was saying, like interactions can't easily account for that much scatter. Um, so we tried a model where the Milky Way and Andromeda have no gravity, and you actually end up with galaxies even above the line, even in this case. So galaxies going away faster than the absence of gravity. Now, so this is a velocity field, which is quite smooth. Um, so you can't really explain velocity dispersion like that. If you tried modify Newtonian dynamics, then it, you could you would get like much more disruption to the velocity field. Uh, so if you look at it um, in more detail, you get something looking like this. So a huge amount of disrupted velocity field, uh, and um, on a Hubble diagram, you can see that essentially all of the local group you could have, as well as material coming in, you could have material flung out at high speed. So basically, this sort of material. Um, now, if you then uh, so what I'm guessing is that that material explains why there actually is material going away even faster than like a pure Hubble flow. So material that's going away faster than without gravity. And that suggests there's been an ancient interaction between massive galaxies in the local group. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, the, uh, hang on, uh, can I just do something quickly? Yeah, so just to show you the latest results from the Fermi mission looking at um, satellite galaxies and whether they have any dark matter in them, which is annihilating. Um, the black line is the latest like constraint, upper limit, because there was a null detection. Um, and the interaction cross-section should be there. Uh, so it basically this range of masses is ruled out. Now there were, people claimed like a signal from uh, dark matter annihilating in the galactic center, which would be around there. That's essentially ruled out. Um, if you try and uh, argue that um, the signal from the galactic center was tall electron instead, then that is consistent. But the problem is that because it's, the interaction cross-section is much lower than the correct value, essentially, it leads to a wrong relic abundance. So that's not a good model. Um, so just to indicate that a lot of the parameter space has been ruled out already. Uh, so I think I'll just um, leave the summary slide up here. Uh, and um, so thank you for listening. Okay, questions for yeah. Do we know anything about the, the uh, ages of the satellite galaxies and their populations ages and that? Are um, they consistent I, with being formed afterwards or all at the same time by a... So the thing planet? is, if you're looking backwards, it becomes difficult to do that because if you had a formation like 4 billion years after the Big Bang, uh, it's a bit difficult to tell whether it's 9 billion years ago or 11, 12. But I think they're all meant to be ancient. Um, as far as the actual populations of stars are concerned. They have also formed stars recently. Mm -hmm. yeah, actually, I was going to make a comment on that, because most dwarf spheroidal and dwarf ellipticals, they show most of these stars, they were actually uh, formed long before, so they're as old as the globular clusters. So that comes down to uh, whether, um, okay, so that may be, that comes down to what, when I expect the flyby to have occurred. So I think there was, so the, yeah, so the, um, when I did the timing argument with modified Newtonian dynamics, and you change various parameters and you get like when the flyby needs to have been, and it, you can push it back earlier by changing parameters with reasonable values. It's hard to get anything less than 4 billion years after the Big Bang. Yeah, that, that might be a problem. All, but remember though that you can have, uh, when you form a satellite galaxy, you might pull out stars from the Milky Way which are already formed, and they end up in the satellite. Yeah, but the problem is the chemistry, because uh, the, the, the abundances of 
clock of just the stars and walks through the stars. Uh, so much remember that most of the block stars in the disk. So if you're going to pull out any star, you have to. You have to do that very early before there's been much meta enrichment. But also, if they're pulled out from the outskirts of the Milky Way, where there isn't much meta enrichment at very early times, um, that might sort of work. Also, a lot of the globular clusters are actually in the planar structure I was talking about. So, if you compare them and see dwarf galaxies to be similar, that's not necessarily surprising. Yeah, I don't quite understand how you can um, do a timing argument. Um, you, you said proportional to AFT uh, distance. Yes. But your AFT is different because if you're longer assuming the point dynamics, then your formation history and your scale factor changes because your cosmology is different. Ah, uh, okay. So I was having to assume a standard like um, cosmology for the, how the scale factors evolve with time. Mm -hmm. um, there might be, so modified neutron dynamics is not like uh, going to explain cosmology because you need a relativistic yeah. extension. And um, I'm guessing that the way that will work will end up very similar to lambda CDM. Um, but um, it might not do, so that might be an issue. Um, could you show the, the picture of the anisotropy of the companions of the Milky Way that you had? Yeah, yeah so um, there should have been. So that was the Andromeda system. Yeah, so that's the R satellites. So, so what's that showing, just, so just to clarify? Th there's, um, all the satellites are out of the plane of the galaxy. Well, I mean, that's, yeah, so that's an important point. We can't see anything if they yeah. were exactly in the plane, because we can't see, like, in the gray band. But, so, so how sure are you then that there's actually an isotropy when there's a large part of parameters because we could not detect any... Well, I mean, it's this gray region, right? We could detect galaxies, like, here... But your probability goes down quite a lot because once you're, you, I mean, there'll still be a scatter of, of, of stars in, in the disk. And what you're looking for is a very slight enhancement of stars above the background. And if you already have a reasonable number of stars, that's just practically impossible to do. So some of these, are, so you can just look at the brightest um, classical uh, satellite galaxies, which people shouldn't have missed, like if they're at like a galactic latitude of 30 degrees. Um, so I'm quite sure we won't have missed that. Um, you could argue that um, the faint satellites shouldn't be included in the calculation, and they weren't, because I was only doing that based on proper motions. So another thing to bear in mind is the proper motions of these objects. If you're arguing that um, they, we, there's an isotropic distribution of objects, and we can only see ones in a plane, then they shouldn't be co-rotating within that plane. You know, there's another possible explanation that the orbits, which are not uh, exactly polar, are unstable, and therefore you things will rotate into a polar orbits. Um, that might possibly be, but like the system around Andromeda isn't polar. Also, this system isn't exactly polar either. Yeah. Okay, we should leave it there. We're out of time. Please thank Ed again. <laughs>